Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. I am so excited to be here today with Brandon C. White. Brandon is a very unique individual in that he is an entrepreneur with two exits under his belt so far. He is an angel investor, a former venture capitalist, and worked in management and marketing at a $200 billion dollar fortune 500 internet company he has an mba from unc chapel hill a master's in psychology from washington college and he's done postgraduate work at stanford i really think he needs a little more education don't you and he's also <laughs> he's also the host of a build a business success secrets podcast and he enjoys biking surfing fishing and going fast so brandon welcome Thanks for having me, Kathy. I'm excited to be here. And before we jump into learning more about you and your story, I just need to know what going fast means. Just do you like to go fast, fast in everything, everything, no matter what you do? Every day, every day, just going as fast as I can, competing as hard as I can. Um, and I want to let you know that when you read that, this is going to be, a, it's like you, you built this whole story up about this guy with all this education. It's like the bar is so high. I don't even know if I can meet it. I don't even know who that guy is. <laughs> well, and that's kind of why I said, boy, he needs more education. Because that's, that's my mom's I fault, I by the way. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, it's my mom's fault. See, when you grow up with a single mom and a, a, a starving artist, uh, your, your mom will always push you to get more education as an insurance policy. Apparently, I've been pushed pretty far. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, part of the reason why, uh, um, you know, you and I had a little chance to chat before we got started here and you've got a nice podcast set up here. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you guys might want to go there and check out his podcast studio, but you're also really casual, laid back, fun. Um, you had to move your dog's bed before we got started. I mean, you're my kind of guy. And then on top of all that, you're like a genius with all of these, um, all this education. And where's my wife? Um, Is she around? Can we get her on the on here real quick? <laughs> I, she she's actually teaching dog school today. We need to bring her on. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Oh, I'm a dog lover. I have three golden retrievers. What do you have? Oh wow! Uh, well, imagine this: a guy who likes to go fast and compete hard. We have three Jack Russells. And a toy poodle. Oh my gosh. Your, your house just has to be a madhouse with dogs running, 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 running. You have no idea how much I love my <laughs> wife. <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, uh, I grew up uh, on a farm and I love Jack Russell's because they, they are like my wife and I. But uh, yeah, this place. Yeah. I mean, then throw in, we had two cats. We have one cat and we have a horse. But the horse doesn't live with you, right? Thank God. It's not like Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> keeping the house, you know, the donkey and the horse in the house. No. Uh, although my wife, if we could, might. But um, I'm really opposed to that, even though I grew up on a farm. So does Arnold really do that? I know I saw yeah. the picture of him. Yeah, he does. And he does. Wow. Because okay, up there, you, I think, you, you know, well, down there, I should say from me in Half Moon Bay, you mm. can, you know, it's outdoors, like, you know, indoor, outdoor houses normal oh yeah you know what i mean but yeah and his, his the donkey and the horse are miniature which maybe that makes it better and i'm sure i mean arnold's a big guy i'm sure his house is giant right um yeah but yeah i, th I think so but no yeah, i saw a picture are, of him with both of them the miniature ones and but you're right you know i'm from the midwest i've always lived in missouri and indoor outdoor we don't have that thing <laughs> yeah i don't know there, i'm originally no from the east coast i would never go back <laughs> Uh, you, you just, you, it's just too, I don't know. You're inside a lot. Yeah. Inside a lot. You really are. Yeah. So let's talk about how you 
got to be who you are, Brandon. I'm so curious, especially about the two exits that you already have under your belt, because I love the idea, number one, that you've built these things. And then that you said, mm, done with that, moving on. So tell us your background, tell us a story about how you got to where you are. And um, I'll just ask you questions as we go. Yeah, um, it is. It is. I've been really grateful to have a a very interesting life. Um, and I think it's mostly because I like to do new things. Like once I get bored, I sort of, I want to be in situations where I'm not, I do not want to be the smartest guy in the room. The day that I'm the smartest guy in the room is the day that I'm scared and the day that I'm leaving. Uh, mainly because I just get bored. But the, uh, I started, graduated college. I'll just start there. And um I love psychology, became a psychology major, told everyone that I was going to become a lawyer because everybody in college is like, oh, what are you going to do after college? So I, my grandfather had a law firm. I was like, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. I didn't do anything, Kathy, to become a lawyer. I was a psychology major, <laughs> which probably does help for trial lawyers, right? But uh, <laughs> I didn't do anything. I didn't. I didn't intern, didn't do anything. But when you say, hey, I'm going to be a lawyer, nobody asks, like, oh, really? Like, what's your plan? Oh, you should be a lawyer. So I was like, oh, I'll be a lawyer. Then I graduated and I was like, oh, well, um, probably not going to be a lawyer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do they need a law? Do you need a law degree to be a lawyer? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good point. But uh, that's a that's probably a whole other podcast we can uh, yeah. get into, right? God Did you know. think about being a stand up comedian? Because you're hilarious. No, I didn't. I, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't. Uh, but I was been thinking about it, watching this comedy store special. And I really do like, I think, I think comedians are one of the hardest. I don't want to get off track, but I do think that it's possibly one of the hardest performing professions in the world. Um, I think so too. It, it, and it, they have to be really smart to be that funny. They have to be smart witty they have to work hard I, i'm i'm right there with you brandon i totally agree the only reason that people think like the truth is is what i found and why people think i'm funny maybe is because and comedians is because you're willing to say things that other people are thinking but won't say and know are true right <laughs> that's right that's exactly right that's it so um and and the reason that i going back to the story that i didn't go to law school was um, quite frankly, I really suck at standardized tests. I have some form of dyslexia for absolute certain. I couldn't, I really couldn't read well. Um, I, I, I've written about this in my blog or I wrote this, like, I don't know, I'm not that old. I'm in my forties, but I don't know. I was like, eh, maybe I'll just write, start writing one day, um, about my life. I think I want to write a book. I wrote this like 26,000 word essay on how I built my first business. And I just did it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. But as I look back, um, I, I can remember, you know, having the tutor and not, not really being able to read. And I can guarantee you, I cannot spell. I literally cannot hear sounds. So I just memorize everything. So if you ask me, oh. and, and I graduated at the top of my class in high school, governor's award, I was psych high national oh, Society president in psychology truthfully, I just memorize everything. And I just, I can read it in my mind as it appears on the page in the wow. book or, or my notes. I take a lot of notes, mm -hmm. but I can read now. I love reading. Um, so long and short is I took the LSTAT test, but I also w would admit um, that I think I just didn't try. I just like, well, really, we're going to, we're going to judge. Like I'm, I I'm a great student. I'm a pretty smart guy. I got all this other stuff and you're going to judge me on a test. Which, you know, what do they say? Um, decide whether you're going to play the game, you're going to hate the game, or you're going to change the game. And I think back then I was just like, ah, I hate the game. And, um, but really all that, it just affects you. So long and short of it, my LSTAT sucked. Um, and, and I think everything happens for a reason. And so I didn't go to law school. So I worked on the tree nursery of all things when I, where I had worked for the summer to help pay my way through school. And um, I think my mom really realized, I mean, my mom's a really smart lady and really has done incredible things with her life and decided that she was going to make a switch of career, gets, goes, gets into Yale, gets her master's. I mean, you know, oh, wow. 
it's a it's a it's a high bar at the White House. But um, the <laughs> the uh, she, wait a minute, that's another stand up joke. <laughs> <laughs> I need to write going. that. You're gonna write that down. You're recording this, right? So we can keep that. I am. You can listen to yourself later and laugh. <laughs> the uh, so I'm digging trees literally and actually having a good time. I'm uh but definitely wondering where life's going to be and I'm sure my mom after busting her rear to put us through very good high schools and a very good college um although I have a lot I did have a lot of student loans um saying like where are you going so she would like t- me taking person I'm like t- having me take personality tests I'm like I'm the psychologist like I've already taken like 10,000 of these stupid things um and just nothing really s- sounded exciting. So her philosophy was just go back to school. You know, one is nobody can take your education. <laughs> uh, 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 no one can take the education away from you, which is true. You'll probably yes. be guaranteed something. And I really do love psychology. So mm-hmm. uh, I go back, I get into where uh, Washington College has incredible psych program for a very small school. Um, I get back and... I am a fisherman and I had lived at a house on the water all through college. I was really, I had incredible college experience fishing every day. And I was like, you know, there's no fishing magazine that, that gives me the information for the type of fishing that I do in the Chesapeake Bay. So I said, I'm, why, why don't I just try to publish it? And back, this is 19, this is 1996. Um, ish. And I was like, I'll just, so I started, I went to the local printer. I uh, did a whole bunch of research. Uh, I could write Washington college actually has the highest literary award of any college in the country. Uh, and I took one writing class every single semester throughout my entire career, mainly because I figured I had to write and spell um, and really in, started to enjoy it. So I I said, I'm just going to figure this out. I I had no business, quote unquote, background at at that time. It was just, um, I'm a pretty curious person and I'm just not scared to to be in a situation where I don't know anything. So I was like, well, if I go to this printer, he's going to ask me all these questions that I'm not going to know the answer, but he's going to give me the playbook and I'm just going to take notes and go back and answer them. So he did. Like, well, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? And I was like, oh, Jesus. Oh, well, at least he's giving me the business plan. And then what I realized ultimately is I didn't have enough money to print my first edition. Um, and I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I started hanging out. I'd always been a self-taught, you know, computer engineer. Oh, I don't I, that would be an insult to current engineers. I'd say programmer. Uh, um, I mean, I had a VIC-20 and a Commodore 64 and read the book and was writing code and and did that sort of programming. Um, you know, I, I wasn't programming Cobalt, um, but I was I was writing code and I just was self-taught. I took the, the book and I went through the lesson. I thought it was the coolest thing I can remember right now. I can remember the smell of the room when I first got my Commodore VIC-20 to count. I was like, oh my God, this mm. thing, I just, I, so it was like four <laughs> lines of code, right? But back then, that was pretty incredible. So I um, started hanging out in the computing lab and there, and I had played around on the internet um, in the, what was it, early 90s, which was really, really early. But I was like, wow, this, this thing, internet thing, I think you can build a web page. I was like, I'll just put this whole magazine online. And, mm. um, so I started programming I started hanging out in the computing lab cause it was free internet access. It was free, had good computers there. And I started watching who was the expert, um, in there. And I just taught myself how to build, uh, back then we had to build web pages on flat HTML, flat files, not database driven files like we have today and taught myself how to do it. And then I found this guy and I was like, Hey, um, I want to build, I want to put a magazine online. I'll pay, I'll, I want you to be my partner. He's like, look, man, I make 
you know, I got to work in this lab. I got school. This is a cool idea, but I don't know. So I was like, hey, I will pay you more per hour than you currently make. Tell me what you make. He told, I don't know what it was. Well, here's the crazy part. I hadn't had any money, but I told him <laughs> that I would do it. So, so I was like, okay, well, finally convinced him. I was like, oh shit. Well, in two or three weeks, I had to pay this guy. So I went out and got a part-time job at a spinach farm uh, that was posted in the college that was looking for like this. I don't even know what to call myself, like executive assistant, accounting, chief of staff. Like I helped run their board meetings. I mean, it was just like this cool wow. thing. But one of the biggest spinach farms in the United States, States out in Galena, Maryland. And they, they gave me an office in a closet. They're like, hey, I was a, they're like, oh, you can turn that into, it was literally a closet. It was, a, I took the thing off the top that you would hang coats <laughs> on. But, you know, it was totally fine for me. It had heat and air conditioning, which is a lot better than being on a tree nursery in the East Coast in the summer. So uh -huh. it seemed like an upgrade. Um, so I start working there, going to school, I'm paying this guy. Within like four months, we're written up in a, in a pretty big magazine on the East Coast getting exposure. And I was like, okay, there's probably this, there's probably something to it. Go figure now, looking now, you're like, oh, of course there's something to it. But, you know, putting a magazine online was, was that we called it vertical networks and all these stupid names, buzzwords they came up with. Um, but that's what I did. And uh, three months later did that. And I was like, oh man, I think there's something here. I think we can, you know, I think this can go somewhere. And, and this guy who was my partner at the time, he's like, maybe. I was like, you know what? And I was, every morning I'd go to the library and read the new, I read like three newspapers. And back then it was Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, and maybe some other ones, Ink Magazine. And in front of Time Magazine, it had a picture of David Philo and Jerry Yang, who were the founders, co-founders of Yahoo. And in the front section of Time Magazine, it had like this, it was sort of like the cool section. It was like half a page, but it was where they would pull, put new things happening. I think they were trying to start to get hip. I don't know what they were doing, but it said, <laughs> it, it said Jerry Lang, David Philo raised 1.6 or $1.8 million from Sequoia Capital. I was like, to build a phone book of the internet, effectively, is what it described it. I was like, oh, if these guys can raise money, I can raise money too. Um, why not? I love it. Brandon, so, I love it when you just see something and go, yeah, I can do that. Well, at least try it. Like, why not? Yeah. Like, yeah, there's just no rules, it. right? Yeah. So I, I tell, I go home, my now wife, my wife and I have been together for, I think, 24 years just had our anniversary last month. Um, and I come back and I was like, Hey, I, I think we got to write a business plan. And she's like, well, how are you going to, do you know how to write a business plan? I said, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I said, but let's go to the bookstore. We got in, got in her car. We drove to Annapolis, Maryland with the Barnes and Noble looking at all these books uh, on how to write a business plan. And I was like, how am I even know what book? And she's like, well, this one says how to write a business plan. Let's buy that one. And I bought it, <laughs> came home, read it over the weekend and bought, built a business plan, an old school business plan, which, uh, which I don't teach and I don't recommend. And thank God they went away <laughs> with them. Although business schools for, yes, some I don't recommend that either. I'm so glad you said that. No, no, you built, I mean, my formula, which is 13 slides, which works. Um, but back then it was like 50 pages and yes. all the, it was, it was so painful. Um, but it was, it was very painful. It was a good exercise. Um, but it wasn't worth crap the day we got done with it. But non, nonetheless, I wrote this thing. We built these financials, taught ourselves how to do it. And I FedExed a copy of that, the Sequoia Capital. And I was like, well, Mike Moritz, who's a very famous to this day, venture capitalist. Um, one of the, I say the original sort of phase two of Sequoia um, after Don Valentine and Pierre and some other people founded it. But uh, I was like, Hey, Mike, I'm doing this thing in fishing, huge market. It's going to be a vertical network uh, community <laughs> site. We're also going to sell some stuff. Think we can do e-commerce. Um, let's do it. And we were, I, 
I'm fast forwarding on a little bit here or there, but we we really were doing some cool stuff. Like we were one of the original Amazon associates. Jeff Bezos sent us a t-shirt and I have a picture oh of it on my website. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I, sent us a t-shirt. <laughs> I was like, Jeff sent us a t-shirt. He's like, what? I was like, yeah, <laughs> we got a t-shirt. This Amazon associates thing. We can build a bookstore and make a bunch of money. And Kathy, we were making money. We were, I That's built the book. Awesome. We were doing the original associate stuff. And then, I, then there's this thing called Travel Zoo. These guys are like, you can build a travel site. I was like, well, let's build the travel site. We'll do an affiliate thing there. And we're getting checks for thousands of dollars a month. I couldn't believe anybody in their right mind would book travel through our site. But hey, what do you know? Right? So mm-hmm. this thing is just happening to us. Um, and we're trying all sorts of stuff. We we didn't have any money, um, so I SEO'd the living crap out of that site, and we I think by the time I had sold it, ultimately had about five hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of free organic SEO a month. Wow, that's amazing! I know. So, oh. what made you decide to sell that business? Oh, you want me to fast forward it? Well, that so long and short is we raised a million dollars. Um, and I did crazy stuff. Like I saw some guy in Forbes magazine. I was like, Hey, that's one of our investors. And my partner was like, you are insane. You don't know him. I said, get his address on the internet. We're going to write him a letter. He's got a fishing rod for God's sake. He's retired and he's rich. He's probably going to be interested in us. And he's like, you are absolutely insane. Yeah. How insane I was, was we wrote him the letter and about four weeks later, he called about two weeks later, I was in Florida and about 72 hours later, I came home with a check for $100,000. So, you know, people are like, how do you raise money? You, you, freaking, you work your ass off. You ask for it. You ask yeah. for it. Yeah. And you got to have a good business, right? Like, it's got to be a decent plan in a big market with product market fit and mm-hmm. all this other crap. But um, yeah, so long and short, why I sold it was uh, we raised a bunch of money. We built a company. We grew too fast. We broke every rule that my $110,000 MBA program taught me that I already knew. <laughs> um, but uh-huh. um, uh, I bought the, the market crashed in 2001. We actually got into a lawsuit with a former employee. It was a total show. Um, closed the company down. Investors were like, we're not putting in any more money. And everybody in 2001 were like, the internet's dying. I was like, the internet's oh dying, people. You're insane. That's hilarious. It's like you're you're uh, you're smoking crack. You're scared. You lost a bunch of money. I lost a lot, a bunch of money yeah. too. Like, right. okay, got to go back to eating tuna fish. Uh, who cares? Uh, I mean, when you're when you're early late twenties at the time, you're mm-hmm. like, who cares? But um, right. I bought the company back from the investors. It was profitable within three months. I ran it as a cash cow for many years as a side hustle of all things. Mm. And then I had a five year plan. Uh, Because I did some things in between. I worked at America Online. I was a venture capitalist at two venture firms. I got my MBA, finished my master's degree because I quit my master's degree to start this business. And um, whatchamacallit, I was like, I I was East, grew up on the East Coast. My wife is from California. And being on the East Coast, like the West Coast is this really cool place that seems a million miles away. You, you know, yes. like East Coast people don't say, oh, I'm going to go to Stanford or I'm going to go to Berkeley. What they say is, oh, we're going to go to Harvard, Yale, or one of the big mm-hmm. ACC schools, right? Well, I went to right. UNC Chapel Hill or something like that. It's just, it's just not in your dialogue. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't, you know, looking back, I get to say this because now once you've been in California for a, a while, you sort of have this different lens, but looking back, I, I never was an East coast guy. Like I always tell people I grew up in Maryland. I had a great experience. I was a Maryland kid, man. I played lacrosse since kindergarten and went to high school in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and there's a lot of great people and everything, but it's like being in the 13 colonies, man. Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, there's still, it's the 13 colonies. You're never going to get around that. And the risk tolerance on the East Coast is just lower. And mm. um, if you can't tell by now, I'm not a guy who generally follows the rules. 
Like definitely not. I mean, rules are. And are, you're a risk taker too. You're a risk taker. I love that. Yeah. I mean, and there's a whole, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think if I'm not taking risks, then it just doesn't get me out of bed in the morning, truthfully. Um, but I, I, I just never really fit there. Um, looking back and I only get to say that because making the leap to move 3000 miles away gives you perspective. Right. But that's a really far leap. But um, I had been exposed to the West coast through a, actually one of the investors. I mean, quick story, cause this is a true story. Uh, one of the investors was actually in my company personally was from Sequoia Capital. He was one of the early partners and I met him through a person uh, uh, through a person. Um, what you call it? Is that you or me, Kathy? That's you. Mm, I'm sorry. Uh, hey, that's, that's, okay. the, that's <laughs> the reality of Zoom. You know, that's what happens. Uh, I have, I'm going to put do not disturb the. Um, so I, I, I had contacted an alumni because in the alumni magazine, of Washington College had said this guy had graduated. I knew him and he was becoming a venture capitalist. I was like, hey, I got this idea. He has lunch with a guy and he says, hey, look, I know you're a pretty private person, but I think you should meet this guy. He is from the West Coast. He's moved to the East Coast for his kids. Um, he's from this famous venture capital firm and he fishes and he wants to meet you. Ooh. And I was like, yeah, give him my address. Three hours later, he writes back and he says, Hey, um, this is Tom. I'm from Sequoia Capital. Uh, I've been using your site. I'd like to see you tomorrow. Now, you're living in East End, Maryland, in a 1,400 square foot house, which was awesome for my wife and I. And we lived in it a long time. I'm really even grateful that we got it. We paid $107,000 for it. Um, uh, and at that point, I was grateful that I wasn't living in a dorm room. But the, uh, can you imagine working out of your spare bedroom? There's you, you, you like, this is just like, I didn't even believe it. So I responded. I was like, uh, X, Y, Z South street, Eastern Maryland. I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, uh -huh. literally he, the next morning knocks on my door. So I was like, huh, <laughs> that's interesting. I was like, Hey man, uh, he comes in, he's like, well, can I see your office? I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go upstairs. And he like <laughs> looks at me. I was like, yeah, upstairs. Let's go. So we go upstairs. And I, and I had actually, Kathy, I'd set up a whiteboard that I didn't even have up there to make it look like it was more of an office than it was a spare bedroom <laughs> with, with my wife's LC 475 Apple computer, which I basically took from her to start this company. And um, he gets in there. You imagine this, right? I mean, this guy is, this guy is a, a big deal one of the original partners, Yahoo started in this conference room. Like we're talking crazy stories. He tells me ultimately, which I'll get to over the years, like Steve Jobs used to rollerblade through his house in Palo Alto. I mean, this is real stuff that you're an East coast person, kid at that point, really young adult. He was like, this is just not right. So he, he, he walks into the bedroom. He looks around, he's looking around. And he looks at me. He's like, is this it? I looked at him for a minute, scared, you know, s -less. I was like, well, mm -hmm. my partner has a spare bedroom down the road that we can visit. <laughs> but, that's all, but that's all we've got. Like, that's all we've got. And I say, hey, look, I, and I start to apologize. Literally, I was like, hey, I'm really sorry. You came a long way to see this. It's not what you expected. I really apologize. Like, can I buy you lunch? Get back on your way. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, calm down. He's like, Brandon, this is how we found Cisco. Uh, 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 husband and wife doing routers on the floor. And I was like, all right. Wow. So we go to lunch. We do the business plan literally on the back of a placemat. Uh, he, to this day, he, he, he had read my, or maybe he didn't at that point, but at some point he read the business plan, but he's like, people... He, four things for him were people, te, uh, the people, the market. What is it? People, market, financing, uh, and product. And he and we literally he turned over the placemat and we went through it. I gave it to him all out of my head. He folded it up and put it in his pocket. 
I was like, hey, you want to go fishing? So we go fishing on the way, way home. He's like, how much money do you have? I was like, oh, I don't know. We trade our, we trade stocks to fund the company. He's like, what? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, we trade stocks. That's how we fund it. In addition to the revenue, we were building web pages. Um, and he pulls out this ratty checkbook, literally, you know, like the, the, the checkbook that has the spine and it's got like half the checks already done. And, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I know. Writes it. In, we're driving home from the ramp. And he, um, he starts writing in his checkbook and then he hands me the check while I'm driving. He's like, I like this. Let's get started. It's $50,000. And to me, wow. that was like, like no paperwork. He's like, we'll yeah, fi- I was like, you want me to sign something? He's like, we'll figure it out. And uh, even the wow. lawyers who was Harry Glazer from G Treat Law, which was an original Northern Virginia law firm. He's like, kid, where's your paperwork? I was like, I don't know, but we got to make it because I promised him we would do this, right? He's like, I don't know who you are. This is insane. So anyway, um, long and short is I bought the company, went to crap, bought it back, made it a cash cow, and um, had a five-year plan that I wanted to be. And the reason I told that story is a few reasons. One is it sort of demonstrates that there's no rules here for entrepreneurs. If you want to build a business, you you got to make some stuff up. And you got to pave your own way. Even me to this day, I'm always looking for like the silver bullet. Like, oh, this guy says he's got this magic thing. I'm, there's no magic. Like the magic is keep moving forward, take chances and make it happen. Um, but that guy actually became really like a dad to me in many ways. We're still friends this year. I mean, friends to this day and done incredible things. Uh, and he's, he's really helped me. Um, but one of the things he did show me was he was originally from the East coast and he came to the West coast and he becomes this very famous venture capitalist. I was like, I want to do that, man. Like just seems like a cool place. So I had, uh, after business school decided that I didn't want to be on the East coast anymore. My wife is super easygoing and she lived, she's from the West coast. She, she lived on the East coast for a long while, but I was like, you know what? I, I'm a tech guy. Like I should be in Silicon Valley The you know, the odds are against you as an entrepreneur when you start out, especially from nothing or, or an idea, you've got to take like every little thing you can get. I was like, I got to be in Silicon Valley. So I had a five-year plan and in and around five years, to, uh, a five-year plan to sell my company, that social networking site. And, um, in and in and around five years, it, it happened. And I sold the company on a Wednesday and bought the house where I'm coming from today on Friday. That's exciting. Congratulations. I love that story, by the way. I mean, that that is like the story that everybody has heard, but nobody has actually lived that I've ever talked to. So thank you for sharing that. That was really fun. Yeah, it's a, I feel really grateful, you know. And I just love um, when you talk about taking risk, um, you sound like that is actually where you get your adrenaline rush is taking risk. Yeah, um, I would, I would describe it in a different way in the sense that not that you're not right. I do think you're right. I think that the adrenaline rush thing gets used as a negative connotation in our society too much. Uh, oh, I don't mean it like that. No, I, I, I know you don't. I know you didn't mean it. <laughs> oh, okay. But, but the <laughs> listeners out there, right? It, it, you know, most of society really believes like, oh, he gets an adrenaline rush or these guys are adrenaline junkies. And I think that that's, I think that that, I don't know why, Kathy, I can't tell you why it, it doesn't make it Feel, it makes it feel like we're addicted to some drug that we can't control. And mm. it, it, it's not true. Like what, what I would tell you is that the, it's not a drug. It's, it's who I am. And to your point, it is what drives me, but you know, there's probably an aspect of a, do, a dopamine and, norepinephrine or not norepinephrine, whatever it is, all these things. Epinephrine. That, yeah, epinephrine. epinephrine. Of all the people, the guy with the master's in psychology doesn't know it, right? Uh, uh, but there's probably an aspect of that. But I am, I would say that really what I, 
where I had said earlier is I really get my energy from being in situations where I need to learn and and being in a new place. So these risks for me really aren't they they are risk, but they're really not a risk for me because if I'm not doing that, I mean I am Kathy a really not bad person. I'm in a bad place when I am not challenged uh, greatly. <laughs> I, I just I, I just, you're in a bad place. Are, are you just bored? Oh, I get depressed. Like, yeah, I'm bored. Oh. I'm depressed. Like, oh, wow. serious. I mean, entrepreneurs don't. Everybody thinks like you're gonna. You know, there's there's. I got this picture where entrepreneurs are always partying and we're living the big life because we're making the money and we're doing this and we sold the company and it's all good. Like. But there's more to it, right? Like, oh, believe was, me, I know. <laughs> if it was just about the money and just about that, we'd get the money and we'd be like, yeah, but people go do it again. Um, so mm -hmm. I think there's just this, um, I think it's just what fuels me. I can't speak for e everyone. And I'm not denying that there's not some sort of endorphin rush that you get from it. But it, but it, it's, it's more than that. It's just... Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's an intellectual curiosity about literally switching this. Like, can I do that? Let's go figure it out. I'm interested. Like, can we, mm -hmm. can, can we do it? So that's how I would explain. Would it. you consider yourself a visionary? Uh, I think that's for other people to define. I, I, I well, I would consider <laughs> you a visionary. Well, I appreciate um, that. Um, but I, <laughs> to me, it just makes sense. Yeah. You just connect the dots in ways that other people don't. I do have the ability, and I, I, I've, I've written that about myself. I, I have the ability to see their enormous amounts of data or points or things and basically Ooh. just see through, see through oh. it, how it connects, how it works, where it's going. Um, I think the other thing is, is that I believe my gut. Like, yeah. I, I believe my gut. It rarely has – I am not suggesting to any entrepreneur or business – uh, creator or whatever out there that you just run by mm -hmm. your gut. Like you should, you have got to, I am a, also a sp spreadsheet nerd who <laughs> will model everything. You should model mm -hmm. it. But by the same token, there's this art to it that you've got to, my, my thing, Kathy, I tell people is if you really want to build a company or do something that you're passionate about, that you're not, you have to believe you can do the thing that you're actually not sure you can do. And if you don't understand that state of be not believing and believing at the very same time, then you probably won't get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I don't believe that. The other I thing I like that. Like anybody can be an entrepreneur. Not anybody can be an entrepreneur. This is a, it is a, oh, no. it is a, it is a, a emotional, uh, physical, uh, it, it, it's thinking hard. Mm -hmm. um, when, so let me ask you this, when somebody comes to you and they're like, you know, I'm not sure if I want to be an entrepreneur, you know, I have this really good job or however they're going to talk about it. What's your advice for them? How do you help them think through whether or not they should build a business or become an entrepreneur or stay at their, uh, stay as an employee? Or do you even get asked that? I get asked that a lot. Um, well, that, you know, people are asking that because they're having obviously that internal discussion in their head and they're scared. Right. right? right. And, and how I would describe it is what it really comes down to in that instance is, do you have the courage? And courage isn't just, is not, not being scared, right? Courage is actually. No, courage is doing death. it anyway. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and yeah, for me, encourages, yeah. <laughs> for me, yeah, go ahead. here's what I'm willing to do. If someone asked me that question, I was like, let's mm -hmm. walk through it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'll help you with the tools and the methods and whatever scars are on my back that you can learn from. And then the true test, Kathy, is do they do it or not? Right. You know, because I don't want to motivate someone to quit their job. Because that, I, agree. I, I don't want to motivate them because the motivation fails, the, the action, the, the habit mm -hmm. dies, mm -hmm. and now they're in a crappy situation. Um, mm -hmm. They have to, if they can't make that leap, 
mm-hmm. then it's probably good that they don't leave. It, I'm not, they're not bad people. They're just different. Oh, I totally agree. Uh, quite honestly, I wish I could have continued being an employee. Um, I was almost 20 years at a Fortune 500 company as a marketer, and I couldn't, I just couldn't do it anymore because they told me I laughed and smiled too much. And so I was never going to be promoted again until I stopped doing that. Well, that sounds and like an absolutely horrible human life. <laughs> Who said, you know, somebody said that to me the other day. They said something like, you're either going to pick your career or your spouse. I'm not going to comment on where it was. I was like, oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Oh, I can't like that? believe that. No, you smile too much. Really? I'd be like, yeah, Yeah. um, Yeah. I'm smiling as I'm leaving today, but thank you very much (laughs) for all your time and effort and energy. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt like I had to quit. It literally, I felt like it was um, quit or die. And so it wasn't scary, as scary for me to quit because, you know, do I want to live or do I want to die? Well, I choose to live. So I quit. And then I figured out what to do, um, which probably in hindsight wasn't the best idea, but I couldn't even begin to think about what to do until I was away from that toxic environment. So I don't disagree with you. And actually it's advice as long. And look, you, it sounds like you worked. I, I, I know your, your background. So you worked 20 years. My guess is, is that you had some money saved up that if you didn't yes. figure it out. So I could live, I could live on. Yeah. Right. That is absolutely key. And by the way, for anybody listening, that's not three worth, months worth of money or even six that your great idea is going to get off the, the ground and start making money. It's right. um, that, and I tell a lot of my, a lot of people I went to business school with who do work in corporate America and they switch jobs. I was like, you should take four months off. And they're like, Brandon, yes, I can't I take totally four agree. months off. I'm like, I took six months off. Well, there you go. Because yeah. you are, and I, uh, well, well, we'll see how controversial it is, but you have been <laughs> indoctrinated into a cult, okay? Yes, I totally and, agree. And a belief system that you are going to have to get out of your head, and that will not happen in a week. No. Right? I, I, and I called it having PTSD because I literally had nightmares that I quit wrong and they made me come back. Well, they're <laughs> like, so, so you have to... You have to clear your mind. And I suggest that people in that transition uh, eat really well, exercise like the devil's chasing you, and Mm -hmm. sleep probably better than you have. And just let let yourself get back to neutral. What people don't do is they don't find their authentic self. And, mm-hmm. and then they just jump and jump and jump. And before they mm-hmm. before you, they do it, they turn 50 years old and they're like, who am I? Yes. That's scary. That true. would scare me. Well, I didn't quit, didn't quit my corporate job until I was 40. And, you know, again, if I knew what I know now, it would have been like, you don't quit at 40. Nobody wants to hire you, but I didn't want to be hired by anybody. Right. Well, that's so, also a good place to put yourself. So here's, that's a really interesting thing, Kathy, because so when I go, so I I graduate business school. I'm working at a venture capital firm of which, by the way, I never, I never lasted in these and the venture capital firm. uh, I never lasted in a corporate environment really that long because mainly I I, I didn't fit, but the, um, to your point is I graduated business school and I left the venture world. Um, and it and it was mutually it was a mutual thing like the the firm was changing, um, and I wasn't happy, and it just worked out for all the right you know at a transition and actually I went off and spent a month in Nicaragua with my friend from business school but, um, I think that people would say to me well Brandon you know, be, becoming a venture capitalist and getting a job is really hard which. It is. I think at the time there was only 700, 7,000 professionals in the world. The one job I interviewed had 900 applicants. Um, and they said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, here's the story for you. I'm going to figure it out. And if I haven't figured it out by the time I'm supposed to figure it out, I'm going to be forced to figure it out because I'm going to be in a situation where the mortgage is going to come due and I'm going to have to pay the bill. Mm-hmm. And um I am not suggesting you anybody put themselves in that position because it's it's not as, as you talked about it's not a very good position. But 
Um, <laughs> putting yourself in situations where there's no way out, right? Like what, what is the, everybody used burn the ships or whatever. There is something mm-hmm. to be said for that. And, and mm-hmm. not because you should do it, but because what you need is it is in you. You've just got to yes. have something that gets it out of you because the system and the beliefs and all of this BS that you are programmed literally in your head has pushed that little opportunity down so far that it just needs to get out. Yeah. I call it don't have a plan B because I see a lot of people who say, all right, I'm going to start this business, but if that doesn't work out, I'm going to do this. And they spend so much time thinking about that plan B and not worrying about plan A because that's the scary one that they never do plan A. So why not just decide plan B is going to be my plan A and go do that yeah. or say, no, there is no plan B. I'm going to do plan A. You know, I mean, we all know that there's always another, there's, there's always something else always. Right. Yeah, I mean, you Brandon, you. you've always had something else. I've always had something else. I agree. Yeah, I've always said I go sell kitchen knives, knocking on doors. I'll probably learn a lot. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I'm serious. Like that's like I a hard. I tell you right now, Brandon, you should be a stand-up comedian. That's your next career. <laughs> Maybe I I feel like that's so hard, but I'm so interested in how they come up with these jokes. I don't. The problem is, is I don't even know. I don't even think. I don't even know what I'm saying is funny. Like I'm I'm not it trying is hilarious. to be. <laughs> I'm t- I'm trying to be funny, but. I guess have you funny. listened to Jerry Seinfeld? I'm going to go down this rabbit hole for a minute. Have you listened to Jerry Seinfeld talk about how comedians craft, how they how they do their craft? Because I'll bet that you could be really interested in that. And I know you like to hang around smart people. And I think he's really smart. I think you should read some of his stuff, hang around him, whatever you need to do and see if you could, because I'm, I'm wanting to listen to you do stand up comedy. I'm telling you. Maybe. Yeah, I have started. <laughs> I've looked at it a little bit. I, uh, I am, I'm super interested in it. I just think it's such a, you know, oh God, it is. I mean, think about, think about this, that, and, and by the way, my wife and I generally watch stand up comedy every night, mainly because we want to end wow. on a positive, happy yes. note. Like mm-hmm. there's just a, mm-hmm. there, you can find a million reasons to be mad and especially like what oh, we're yeah. going through today. Like, we got COVID, we got this presidential thing. Like there's, yeah. there's plenty of reasons. I think that, I think that the, the challenge in life is finding the good things that, you, you know, that you have, but we watch stand up mm-hmm. comedy every night. And um, I just look at it. I'm like one person, one mic, really no mm-hmm. props other than a stool and a bottle mm-hmm. of water, which appears to be like the thing that you got to have. Maybe I, I guess <laughs> I don't know what the hell it does, but it, it must have some magic because they all have it. Hey, Ron White, he has, he always has his booze, right? Oh, booze. Yeah. You know which one? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't have booze. Uh, I wouldn't have booze. I'm a problem. With he me used to have a cigar. He used oh. to have a cigar. I don't know if he still has a cigar, but he used to have that too. I can't but watch yeah, that guy who takes it. off his shirt. It's disgusting. <laughs> okay, so who are your favorite comedians? Stand-up oh my comedians. god, I love Sebastian. Uh, oh, I love Sebastian. I love him. Yes, he's like. I agree. He is. We watch. He's hilarious. When in you're doubt, like him, Brandon. You could totally do what you're like him. You could totally do what he I, does. I, I, I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely, he is really, really, really good, and he's worked really hard. He is. He, um, we will watch. When in doubt. We just, we could watch him every time. Um, mm-hmm. I think Tom Gora is fu- funny. I think Joe Rogan is really funny. Um, I do not find Joe Rogan funny at all. I know. I so, he's a guy favorite. Uh, <laughs> I think that you either. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, my wife doesn't really like him either, but he is funny. I, I, I don't know. It, whatever it is. I, I interviewed another lady the other day and she's like, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not doing Joe Rogan. I was like, okay. Um <laughs> The, uh, I think Joe Rogan is just really something, someone that guys really, really like. And I think that's awesome. I mean, there are women comedians. No, that Joe, I love, prefer. yeah. Uh, what's her name starts with an I? Yeah, not is a, is a, is a, do you know who I'm talking about? Blonde hair, super mm-hmm. funny, just got married. Mm-hmm. Is, is Elia? I don't know. She's, she is so funny. Um, How about Jim Gaffigan? He's one of my favorites. Uh, I like Jim. I like, I'll tell you 
So here's here's how much we like Jerry Seinfeld. We yeah. two years ago took a flight from San Francisco to Dallas, got in a car, drove north to Oklahoma to the Windstar Resort, which is apparently the largest uh, play, uh, largest casino in the world. It's like a mile long, and watches Jerry okay. Seinfeld. And uh, wow. I love Jerry Seinfeld. I love uh, Chris Rock. I do too. I, I love him. I have very rarely seen um, anyone in person. I don't do in person stuff. I just like television. But I've seen Jerry in person. That's uh, and I agree. He he is by far my favorite. You know, he has that new Good. book. I was out. Did you read that yet? With the he mm -hmm. reads all his. Oh, he's got this thing. It's an audio book. I was going to get. Um, but he reads all of his jokes that he's done. Um, oh my gosh, I have to get that. All his good jokes. Gonna be, yeah. So yeah, I love, um, I think that is just, yeah, I'm really, so here's, here's, here's my COVID interest. Um, I've always <laughs> been into stand up comedians, but I, I really have gotten into what you're saying, like is the art and how uh -huh. they do it. And here's uh -huh. something I bet you would never guess. I am learning how to freeze ice cubes so that they're clear. Oh, interesting. Yeah, right. I, I think you're being very kind. You're like, I'm interviewing listen. this guy who's no, I'm nuts. serious. I'm interested. No, I'm interested in this because I have this issue too. I don't like cloudy ice cubes. There you go. <laughs> so I started studying this. And <laughs> do you know that clear ice cubes stay cold longer? <gasps> I didn't. Yeah. Is it because they have vodka in them? <laughs> Yours, <laughs> but mine don't. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just thinking about what when do i see clearer ice cubes and i'm like well they have booze in them they're usually clear but so what's your secret in making clear ice cubes? well they're not my secret yet? i've like watched all these damn youtube videos and then finally my wife i think she's just getting annoyed of all the ice cubes <laughs> in the ice cube tray that she says i'm taking up the room and she's like look here's how you do it and i was like fine how and basically you have to, it's how the water freezes. Cause Kathy, I had all sorts of rigs. My wife's getting so annoyed. I'm like boiling water six times, uh, taking all the impurities. I got my wife buying this like water from the store. None of it worked. What works is, is you, you put the ice cube tray in another uh, insulated cooler, so to speak, so that it freezes from the top down not all around. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah, it's huh. so cool. And when you get a clear ice cube, so now I got these skulls, skull mm -hmm. ice cubes that are completely yeah, clear. That sounds they're cool. totally freaky. They freak me out even looking at them, <laughs> but they're cool. Okay, so Brandon, you know where you've just gone with this story, right? This is totally a Jerry Seinfeld skit. Is a it? bit right here. Oh my God, of course. Um, yeah, well, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> of course, of course, clear ice cubes. of course. All right. So uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap this up because like I said, I've got another interview I have to do after this. Oh my but God. before we do, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the business that you are working on now, your podcast, Build a Business Success Secrets podcast, and anything else you want to talk about, about the business that you're running now and how others can learn from you, Brandon. Um, wow. Uh, I would say now you're like that, back to that boring stuff. I want yeah, to talk now we're talking about cubes. business. So, <laughs> so thank you. I, I basically over 24 years came up with a formula. I studied it, figured it out, tested it, failed, got funding. Um, and I came up with a business plan formula that you can build your business plan in 13 slides and you can do it really quick. Uh, you got to build your financials, which does take a little longer. So I don't want to oversell it. But that's really what I found myself teaching, mainly because most people don't build business plans and they don't build business plans for three reasons. One is they don't think they have the time. Two is they don't know what goes into it. And three is they're scared of the financials. And um, you, you have to build the business plan. And not only that, Kathy, but I don't know if you know this, but there's actually studies in science. There's a Harvard article that, and there was a whole bunch of scientists from Harvard that studied a bunch of entrepreneurs and you're 16% more likely to be successful with a business plan than not. And 
you know, some people will say, well, Brandon, 16% seems pretty low. And my answer is in Vegas, one half a percentage point luck makes you a winner in the, in the casino at blackjack. So um, it's, it's actually a really big deal. And this formula works. Like I've just, I just, it just took me so long and I love helping people. The truth is, is so many people help me get here that didn't need to. Um, I have found, you know, I always get this answer like, well, Brennan, you're so, you, you know, you really want to help people. Why don't you just give it away for free? I give a lot away for free, but here's what other, another thing I found. Now, now you got me like on this, on this roll um, is every time I give stuff away for free, the people don't, they aren't accountable. So they, that's right. They don't do anything with it. But Absolutely. my students, my students who pay, put yep. it in the action and it works. That's right. That's exactly right. So, um, and here's, this is I like. experience the same thing. You do too? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, why do we still do it though? Why do we still give it away for free? Well, I give a little bit away for free. Um, well, the podcast stuff and stuff like that's always free, but right. then hopefully people get a feel for like, not everybody going to want to work with me or you, Brandon. I mean, no. while I think you're an awesome guy, not everybody's going to want to learn from you. And I think I'm pretty awesome too, but not, you know, about half the time people look at me and go, is it your birthday? Cause I always have a tiara on. <laughs> I liked it. I, I thought it was just normal, but I'm from California. So you, or in the Midwest, I mean, that's probably a little out there, Kathy, but. Oh yeah. They always want to know if it's my birthday. And your glasses um, match, which I absolutely love. Thank you very much. And your shirt. And this, this is my brand color. Thank you. Um, I don't always match today. I just happen to. Um, but if they don't have any skin in the game, you know, that phrase, they're not going to. And that. here's the, here's the truth. The truth is, is that I find that with myself. Like, and I oh, bought, absolutely. I bought courses. I, uh, I had bought courses that got me back into podcasting. I bought a course of all people who has been teaching a long time on how to build a course. I bought a course on how to build a course and it held me accountable because I paid a lot of money for that course, a few thousand mm -hmm. bucks. It had very good material, but it just made me get there because otherwise you're going to have this yes. guilt that you spent three thousand dollars and it didn't do anything yeah yeah and another example of that is uh, masterminds i've been in masterminds i've paid for and i attend every single thing i participate fully and then somebody from that mastermind will say well this one's ending how about if we just all get together and do this for free It'll together never work. we don't charge anything and guess what but by, by like session three, I'm like, no, I'm not attending anymore yeah because you don't have to in fact this one mastermind is free that they, every Friday, I like, it's on my calendar. If they just would charge me $250 a year, even I'd show That's up. Right. It's true. They're like, well, we don't want to charge Brandon. We're all, we're all in this together. Well, yeah. I'm clearly not in it together with you because I never show up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're in it with yourself. Yeah. So um, for people who want more of what you have to sell, where do they go? Uh, I think the best place is just to go to my website, brandoncwhite.com. Brandoncwhite.com. Brandon, would you do me a favor? When you are going to do your first stand up, invite me. <laughs> You're the marketing lady. You get me a get. I, I don't even, I can't do that, but I will. I, 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 I mean, you're hey, the agent. I'm going to tell you right now. All right. How about this? Okay. I'm going to throw something at you. Like a challenge. You like to go fast. What if we get 10 people who post in the comments on YouTube or post in the uh, reviews on uh, the podcast and say, we want Brandon C. White to do a stand up Zoom with Kathy. I'll host it. Then you do your stand up thing. How many do we have to get before you will do? And I don't, it, it can be five minutes. It can be 50 minutes. What? 50 minutes. Boy, that'd be a long stand up for the first one, wouldn't it? I mean, the last I checked, like comedy stores, like five minutes. But I mean, you're, yeah. you're already. So you can do five minutes. Like, you can do however long you want. You're laughing, and but I'm, I'm the one who's going right to have to do I it. Can, 
I can get hundreds of people on here. I really can. Are you joking? No. I don't know. I, I'm open to it. I don't know what the rule is. Like 10 seems too low. <laughs> 10 seems low. How many do you want? You, you're going to like call 30? your friends and get 10 people. <laughs> on exactly. stuck doing You know me. It. Yeah, you I know. Do. Me. I know. I, I got it. Uh, okay. What would many, make it worth your while? How many what would you make think? it worth your while to do it? If you had a hundred, like I'd feel forced to do it. I really would. All right. A hundred. A hundred people. I, I, this is going to be my new goal. Cause I want, are you going to help with the, Steve. with the, like, I don't even know what I'm, I don't even know if I should commit to this, but fine. You get a hundred <laughs> comments. Hey, you know what? I know you well enough to know that you're going to reach out to Jerry Seinfeld. You're going to have I, him listen to this little bit here and you're going to go, Jerry, I need your help. She got a hundred people to say, I yes, will do I that. Do. I will. Okay, cool. Do it. Absolutely. Hey, this has been Absolutely. really fun. Thank you for having me. Oh, Brandon, thank you. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. You really made my afternoon. And um, I can't wait uh, for you to be the new Sebastian and say, you're going to stand up there and go, I need to thank Kathy Guggenauer. I will. I will. You'll be the first for person giving I thank. me the push. Or the first person <laughs> I come this. to kill. After they all, they, they, after they do that and I will drive out there in my RV and knock on your door. Hey, Kathy, you know, that really funny joke. You're the comedian. You played it on me. And now these people are lambasting me on the internet. Oh, oh. all right, Brandon. Thank you so much for being Enjoy your on day. Here. You too. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There, you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.